In the beginning, in the beginning when God spoke, whatever he spoke came into being. In the first chapter of Genesis, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let dry ground appear, and it was so. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. Throughout Genesis chapter 1, we have this repeated phrase, and God said. And then it was followed by, and it was so. God spoke everything into being. God's word brought into existence everything that is, everything that was, and everything that ever will be. Words are powerful. The words that we use as human beings may not have the same power as God, but they still have power. Growing up, when somebody made fun of you, was giving you a hard time, did you ever respond with a phrase, we even did this when I was little, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. What rubbish. (laughs) What absolute rubbish. Words affect us. A kind word can lift us up, but a hateful word can tear us down. Words have power. I found an illustration online. It originally came from uh, the magazine U.S. News and World Report, and it's, it's an old article, but I think it still holds true. It's from 1994. And it says this. It's talking about marriages. In order to uncover the processes that destroy unions, marital researchers study couples over the course of years and even decades and retrace the star-crossed steps of those who have split up back to their wedding day. What they are discovering is unsettling. None of the factors one would guess might predict a couple's durability actually does. Not how in love a newlywed couple say they are, how much affection they exchange, how much they fight, or what they fight about. In fact, couples who will endure and those who won't look remarkably similar in the early days. Yet when psychologist Cliff Notarius of Catholic University and Howard Markman of the University of Denver studied newlyweds over the first decade of marriage, they found a very subtle but telling difference at the beginning of the relationships. Among couples who would ultimately stay together, five out of every 100 comments made about each other were put-downs. Among couples who would later split, 10 out of every 100 comments were insults. That gap magnified over the following decade until couples heading downhill were, f- were flinging five times as many cruel and invalidating comments at each other as happy couples. Quote, hostile put-downs act as cancerous cells that, if unchecked, erode the relationship over time, says Notarius, who with Markman co-authored a book called We Can Work It Out. In the end, Relentless, unremitting negativity takes control, and the couple can't get through a week without major blow-ups. The words we use when speaking to one another have power. Whether it is in a marriage, or in a friendship, or to a passing stranger, our words have power. The words God used to speak creation into existence had power. The word, Jesus, through whom all things were made, was there 
at the beginning. And this is where John starts us off in his gospel. And he tells us, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Last week, I mentioned that it can be kind of difficult for us sometimes to understand this idea of beginning. Our human brains work the way human brains work. Our human brains understand the way human brains understand. But God is so much greater than what we can understand. After that beginning, everything we know, everything we know now was created. Last week, too, we talked about that order of creation. How God created light before he created plants. How he created plants before he created the animals that eat the plants. What John is trying to tell us here in the first couple verses of his gospel when he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. What he's trying to tell us here is that Jesus was not created. We have all been created. All this stuff around us has been created. Jesus is creator. Jesus has always been. There is not a time when Jesus was not. There is not a time when Jesus did not exist. God did not create Jesus because Jesus is God. And God is creation. Did you get all that? We are created. God is creator. God is creation. And this is something that can be a little difficult for us to understand, maybe impossible for us to wrap our brains around. And though we may never understand this idea, it is vital that we accept and believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All 100% God, each 100% God, but not all the same. I don't know how that works. I don't know how that works. It's outside of my understanding, but I accept it as truth. And the Word was God. Verse 4, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Because Jesus was there in the beginning, and in him was life, this life that John is telling us about now, in him was life, is the eternal life that we can have through Christ Jesus. Now let's contrast this idea of life, eternal life, with another idea of existence. Life versus existence existence. To exist, to simply exist, is to simply be. Can anyone tell me what this is? It's a rock. Yeah. Anybody know what it's made out of? It is granite. Yes, it's granite. Um, Anybody know where it comes from? It comes from the earth, more specific than earth. Any ideas? You're in the right state. This is Black Hills granite. Does anybody know specifically what mountain this might come from? It's not Mount Rushmore. I think if you took a rock from Mount Rushmore, you'd go to prison. So this is not from Mount Rushmore. But you're, you're along the right path. Crazy Horse. This is a rock from the Crazy Horse Mountain. They have a big bin sitting there if you know where to look, and you can just take a rock. It's a great way to get rid of all the rocks that they're chipping off. (laughs) Crazy horse. And I chose this rock because it fit in my car. (laughs) It was a good reason to pick it. But does this rock, does it have life? Does it have eternal life? Well, it's something God created, isn't it? But no, I, I don't think it has eternal life pretty sure it doesn't. Does it exist? Well, yeah, of course it exists. I'm holding it right now. I know it exists, unless we're living in the matrix or something. I know this exists. So 
What about people? I would say every person has life, certainly by our definition of life, but not every person has eternal life. And without that life, without that eternal life, we simply exist. Now, this rock is not useless. I'm not saying it's useless. I use this as a bookend in my study. Props up some books. Uh, plus, it, it's, it's a cool story. You tell people this is from Crazy Horse Mountain. That's kind of a cool story. You could use it as a hammer if you needed to use it as a hammer, right? You could use it as a paperweight if I had to set it down as a paperweight. You could use it to smash open a window if someone's in a burning car or a burning building. You could use it for that. You could file down this point and use it to cut something. An artist could maybe carve this into, I don't know, a bird or something. I'm not an artist. I don't know what you could carve this into, but I bet you could make something out of this. It is not useless, but it doesn't have life. People that don't know Jesus are not useless. Often we, we have this image, I think, of someone that is atheistic or agnostic or doubting, and we think that they have this sad, miserable, downtrodden, meaningless life, and it simply isn't the case. I've met a lot of people in my lifetime that don't believe in God or don't believe in a Judeo-Christian idea of a God that are perfectly happy and productive people. They simply don't have that eternal life within them, that life that comes from Jesus Christ, that life that is the light of all mankind. Do you exist? Or do you have life? Keep in mind, too, that having eternal life, that life given to us through Christ Jesus, it doesn't begin when we die. Remember what Jesus said when he's addressing his father in the Lord's Prayer. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done. What? On earth as it is in heaven. Living the eternal life for Christ begins the moment you come into that personal relationship with Jesus. The moment you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible, and it uses the word overcome here in verse 5. And I've read that there are a few different ways that you can actually translate this word. The first one is, as the New International Version uses it, this version of our, the Bible that I'm reading from today, uses overcome. Some others use the word understand or comprehend. Darkness has not understood it. There's another way you can put it, just to extinguish, as in blowing out a candle or putting out a fire. The darkness has not extinguished the light. When we think about physical light, the light that is around us right now, the light that we're using to read our Bibles and our hymnals and our bulletins, when we think about that, if we want to make it dark in here, is there something we can introduce that we can bring in to make it dark? Does anybody have a reverse flashlight? You point it at an area and it makes the area dark? Anybody? No? Nobody? I've used this example before as well. This is just an empty box. If I open this box, there's no light in there right now. Is the light going to go into the box or is the darkness going to spill out of the box? The light's going to, well, let's see. Let's, it's always worked before that the light goes in the box, but let's just double check. Look at that. The darkness didn't spill out. Darkness cannot overcome light. Let's think of light and darkness not so much for this example as good and evil or good and bad, but let's think of it as connected to and separated from God. 
Being in the light is to be with God and to have life. Being in the darkness is to be separated or to be separate from God and to simply exist. So what does it mean for the darkness to not understand the light? The second possibility for the translation. Have you ever been in a situation where you did the right thing simply because it was the right thing and then people thought you were crazy for doing it? You hear stories every once in a while of, of people that are homeless or down on their luck or whatever it might be. They find a wallet with a big wad of cash in there, maybe $1,000, and they track down the person that lost it and they give every penny back to them. And we lose our minds over this. The world just goes nuts thinking, it's so amazing that this person did this, that they gave back all that money. But what the world doesn't understand is the goodness in that act. They don't understand the light in that act. The darkness, the separation from God cannot understand. It cannot comprehend the light. The darkness cannot understand the light. The third possibility here is extinguish. The darkness cannot extinguish the light. And let's try to understand this from a point of belief. Does God exist? Does God live? Because we believe in him. Or does God live because God lives? Today we are here worshiping God. If everyone on earth stopped believing in him tomorrow, would he cease to be? No. God is not real because we believe in him. God is real because God is real. Unbelief, darkness, cannot extinguish the light of God. As we remember the light coming into the world in the form of that human baby named Jesus, and as we realize the light is with us today, in this world, and as we prepare for the light to return one day soon, each of us must decide where we want to be and where we are. Unbelievers and believers both often fear the light because in the light, we, who we truly are, those negative parts of our personality can be exposed, but we can hide in the darkness. Most of you know I, I love rock music, and that's my favorite stuff. I think Pink Floyd, though, is my favorite band. I just I love Pink Floyd. Their one of their probably their last real studio album came out around 1994. It's called The Division Bell. And in that on that album, there's a song called Coming Back to Life. And when David Gilmour sings this song, he doesn't sing it from a biblical perspective. It's not. It's not a Christian song. It's not a godly song. But there's a lyric in it that seems to fit what I'm talking about today. And the lyric says, I knew the moment had arrived for killing the past and coming back to life. I knew the moment had arrived for killing the past and coming back to life. So do we play it safe? and remain in the darkness, hiding, simply existing? Or do we take a chance with the light, risk being exposed for who we are, killing our past, killing our past, moving into that light and coming into life, eternal life in the light of Jesus Christ? Darkness or light? Simple existence or eternal life? Separated from God or in constant communion with God? The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth.
Let's pray.